oh, Benjamin, come back. <laughs> I thought you were running out on me. You're not allowed no. to. <laughs> Sorry, no, I, I had to close. I had That's to close okay. the window. Um, oh, okay. Now, did you want to introduce yourself after I introduce myself, just so they know who you are at the beginning? Or what did you want to do? Did you want to do in your part? I think I can do it in, in my part, so okay, that's fine. Is there any possibility to change the background um, picture? <laughs> yeah, do you, if you, yeah, if you go down to the video at the very bottom, yeah. where it says uh, stop or start video, and you click on the up arrow, I have a choice of choosing a virtual background. Ah, oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think I just do that quickly. <laughs> yeah, I have a picture of our library where I would be working if I weren't working at home. Perfect. Nice place. It, oh, it's be, the students love it, I have to tell you. They just totally love it. Uh, Oops, 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 where am I now? Good morning, everybody. Welcome, and we'll be starting in a few minutes. <laughs> morning, John. No, I didn't stay up late. I just got up early. <laughs> Good morning. Morning, everybody. We'll be starting in a few minutes. morning. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Morning, everybody. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Yeah, that's right, Constance. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you can see and hear me, but we can't see and hear you. But you can put uh, comments into the chat box or the question and answer box. Oh, thank you for putting that tweet up, John. That's just great.
Morning, everybody. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Okay, everybody, I think I'm going to start now. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jane Fry, and I would just like to say welcome to the first vir virtual eddy. I've never attended eddy before, but I have been to a number of natties, which is a North American DDI conference. This year, I will miss seeing the Christmas lights of Paris, but I saw some pictures of them on the news the other day, and they really did look quite beautiful. I'm sure that there will be some of you here today who will know what DDI is, so this tutorial will be more of a refresher for you. I hope there are some of you here who do not know what it is, though, because that's what Benjamin and I will be talking about. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat box. I cannot promise to answer them right away as I'm not good at presenting and keeping an eye on the questions, but your questions will be answered at some point. Both Benjamin Benjamin and I plan to talk for about 20 minutes each, so that will give you time to ask questions at the end of each one of our sections. Um, there's one other thing I want to mention before we start here. I want to apologize now for any and all of my fumbling about when I am presenting and answering questions. You see, it is 4 a.m. here in Ottawa, and I think I'm awake, but we will see. Um, and before we begin, just to tell you a bit about myself, I'm the Data Services Librarian at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. And Research Data Management and DDI are two of the main areas of my responsibility. I'm also the lead for Carleton's Institutional Strategies Working Group. I'm also on a number of other local, national, and international committees, including co-chair of the DDI Training Committee chair of the Odyssey Data Deposit Policy Working Group, and I'm a member of the National RDM Training Working Group. I also want to mention that this session will be recorded, so if you don't want your face to be out there, please uh, turn your camera off. And as well, John Johnson mentioned earlier that there is a tweet that people can use, so um, John will put it up again there, so feel free to tweet out anything you want to. Okay, and now we begin. What can DDI do for you? An introduction to DDI. Just to get this started, just a minute here. Okay, here's an outline of uh, what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to start with the importance of metadata and what is DDI, and then tell you a bit about the DDI codebook. <clears throat> Excuse me. Benjamin will then talk to you about DDI lifecycle. Fair, fair, and a couple other DDI points. So I always like to begin my DDI talk with just a little bit about metadata. Because to import, understand the importance of DDI, you first have to understand the importance of metadata. Okay, you look at this picture of a tin can on your screen, and what do you see? What is in it? Is it something you're going to be having for breakfast or for lunch? Is it some food for your pet, perhaps? Or maybe you're going to be renovating your living room and this is a, a tin of paint. Or maybe even you're going to be doing an oil change on your car and this is a tin of oil. You see, without the metadata or the label for this particular tin, you have no idea what is in there. However, if you look at this slide here, you know what is in all these tins because there are all the labels that are on the tins. By the way, I do like to use food examples when I am whenever I can do any talks about uh, DDI or data, because it just helps everyone to understand what I'm talking about. 
And I also want to give a shout out here to my colleague, Mike Steelworthy, because he's the one who gave me this, the idea for this example, because he said it just gets the idea of metadata across great in his classes. And I totally agree with him because when I'm doing an in-person workshop, I give them an actual exercise, break them into small groups and give them each a tin with no label on it. And I make them tell me what is in the tin. Okay, so let's bring this data, this example into the data world. When you look at the screen, you can look at some of the numbers and you can guess what they stand for. However, do you know what all the numbers are for? There is no way you can know what all the numbers are for. And at this point, I do want to give a shout out to my colleagues and a note of thanks to those who presented at EDI 2019, Hilda, Benjamin and Tina, because I've used many of their graphics because they were too good not to use. Okay. You're looking at this slide and you've probably got some questions in your mind. What is this study about? Who created it? What was the previous question? What do the variables mean? And I want to mention here that these clouds contain only some of the questions that you would have when you looked at this uh, particular slide. <clears throat> you also have to remember the end goal of metadata is for the audience to know what the survey is all about. What you should think about is that if you need this information, the others will also need it. For example, the cloud that says, what is the meaning of the codes? Well, let me give you an example. For the geography variable, in Canada, there are 10 provinces and three territories. They are often coded with numbers and not with characters. So if you see a number 10 in the geography variable, then you have to go to the metadata to tell you what the number 10 stands for. Otherwise, you don't know that this particular value in the geography variable stands for Ontario. Okay, DDI stands for Data Documentation Initiative. It is an international metadata standard. Now the metadata can be about the study, that is, what is it about? Is it the abstract? Who created it? Who funded it? Who is the population? And what was the mode of collection? It can also give you information about the data set. What does this variable mean? What question was asked? Was there a follow-up question? What is the value of this particular variable? And it's used primarily in the social and behavioral sciences, economics and health. And it's an open standard designed for data sharing and reuse. So it's a structure for describing data and it's related information. So the DDI standard structure means that all computers, even if they're using different applications, can work on the same data and related information. This is where DDI comes in. It puts the metadata into a structured format to help the data user find everything about a survey that is available, as long as the information has been entered into DDI. And it is written in XML, so the format is not proprietary to any specific system. If you want more information about DDI, the website's an excellent resource for you. Uh, there's different tabs with uh, training materials, the products, upcoming and past events, publications, and if you want to collaborate. So feel free to go to this website to find out more information. Okay, now I want to talk to you a bit about DDI Alliance. It's a self-sustaining member organization that was created in 2003. Now, the great thing about this is that if you are planning on implementing DDI in your institution, you should look into becoming a member of the DDI Alliance because being part of it means you are able to give input when they are discussing changes, edits, and new formatting. So the members do have a voice in DDI development. If you have any questions, feel free to contact the executive director, Jared Lyle. And all the information you want, including his contact information, is online. Uh, the charter, the bylaws, the forms, and anything else there. And I've put the link right here in the slides. And the slides will be available afterwards for you. So DDI consists of an executive board. And this is the policy making and oversight body of the Alliance. There's also a scientific board, which is responsible for the work to develop the standard. And then there is the technical committee. They maintain the various DDI products in collaboration with the different working groups of the DDI Alliance. Now, these working groups are convened to work on different activities and topics within the work areas of the DDI Alliance. And currently, there are six working groups. And the training committee, of which I am co-chair, is one of these working groups. 
I like to throw in this diagram because it just gives you an idea of what has happened with DDI and the milestones. Uh, it goes from 1995 to 2015, and uh, you can look at it later in your uh, spare time if you're interested in it. Why use DDI again? Well, for comprehensive description, for effective data sharing, because it's a structured standard, for its machine actionability and interoperability to drive systems. And one of its most important focuses is on metadata reuse. So these are some of the benefits of using DDI. The interoperability I mentioned uh, was using the XML earlier because it can be used for cross-platform use. And you can get rich content when you're using the DDI. You can get right down to a very granular level. For example, if you are looking to see what the title of a survey is, there is also the option of entering a subtitle, a parallel title, and an alternative title. So this could be a title in another language or an acronym, which is used for that particular survey. So you can see it can be quite expansive. So therefore, this really increases the search capability, and it can give you great precision in searching. Another benefit of DDI is the fact that it is an international community. Just as there are benefits, though, there are also challenges of using DDI. And one of them is the complexity of it. For some people, it is not intuitive to learn. It is a very steep learning curve, but there does come a point when it will seem like second nature to you. I've been doing DDI for 10 years now, and when I first learned it, I was in such a fog. It was so hard to figure out everything that was going on. I went to workshops, I did reading, I took talk to colleagues, and then one day it just clicked, and I was really happy the day it clicked, I have to tell you. But the level of complexity you will be dealing with depends on the tool you will be using to interpret it. Another challenge of DDI is the level of researcher buy-in, because it really is quite low. You have to remember, the primary goal for researchers are data and analyses, not metadata but the metadata needs to be perceived as an essential part of research because the researchers have to understand that high quality metadata in an accessible format is essential for the whole research process. It's not just for them, but for others who are using their data. So getting started with DDI can seem daunting at first. But the process is broken down into steps and there's lots of help available. I mentioned the website earlier, but there's also colleagues that you can talk to and other researchers. And as well, there is a listserv you can put your questions out on. And uh, other uh, folks are really good at getting back to you with answers for your questions. So DDI, I had mentioned earlier that it's written in the XML format, and it's important we talk about how to interpret DDI when we talk about getting started on DDI, because that is one of the challenges in interpreting it. But there are three popular tools out there. There's Nestar, Collectica, and Dataverse. And if you look at the program for Eddy over the next few days, you'll notice that there are different sessions on it that you can attend to find out more about these particular tools. So this XML schema is a way of tagging the text for meaning and not for appearance. The XML defines which tags are available, the order the tags will appear in a document, because the tagging or the markup follows certain established rules. It also defines whether the tags are required or optional, and whether the tags are repeatable or not. And I like to throw in examples of XML tags at this point in time so you understand what I am talking about. And I put this slide in here also just to convince you that a tool is needed to interpret DDI. There could be some of you here today who are able to interpret this particular slide, can read it, but most likely not many of you can. Now, I bolded the parts in here that you would read if you were using a tool to interpret DDI, but normally XML does not have this bolding in it. So you can he see here some examples of some of the tags that are used in DDI to define the metadata in a survey. For example, there's a tag about the title of the survey, a note about the data, a tag about the data checking, and a tag about the number of variables that are in a particular survey. So once you know what to look for, then you can start reading the XML 
and uh, get an idea of how difficult it can be. Now, I mentioned earlier that DDI is about an international community, and that is definitely one of the benefits of using DDI. So on this particular slide, on the left-hand side, we have some of the agencies that are using DDI. And on the right-hand side, we have some of the projects that are doing DDI. And I am mentioning here that it's only some of them that I've put up here on the slide. But I'd like to show you this map because it really does show you how DDI is used internationally. And uh, for some people having a data visualization is much easier than just reading a list of names. Okay, and some of the DDI audiences I should mention, because I've talked about users, I should mention who the audiences are, are the librarians, managers, repositories, researchers, developers, and there is more information on how each one of these audiences use DDI on the Alliance website. This is really important to mention here a caveat that DDI is a powerful metadata standard, provided that the correct information is entered into the appropriate fields when marking up the document. So DDI does have the power to help you, but the information has to have been entered in and it has to be entered in properly. If it's not entered in, then you don't have it. It's sort of like having a brand new car, but there's no gas in the car to get it going. So DDI standards being developed over time, and I should mention here that it is continuing to develop based on what the users want. So currently it has three main products, the DDI code book, the DDI lifecycle, and DDI CDI or cross domain integration and that one is forthcoming and there is a session on that right after the session Benjamin and I are doing on uh, the DDI CDI so if you want more information um, go ahead and tune into that one. Each one of these products have been designed for a different purpose. <clears throat> Now, um, remember I expressed earlier on my thanks to my colleagues who presented last year at EDI 2019, and I was really grateful for the slides they used. Well, the next few slides are ones that they put together, so I'm definitely using them because they are just excellent to use. This is an example of DDI Codebook using Lego. On the left-hand side, you have this box of Lego pieces, and they're just a big jumble. You really don't know what they are. You have no guidance as to what's in the box. But once you have a certain standard and metadata structured, this would be like the DDI codebook. On the right hand side of the screen, this is what you get from that box of jumbled pieces. Now, for DDI lifecycle, you start off with the same jumble of pieces, Lego pieces in a box. But their next step is they are put into another box which has compartments. So the pieces are divided up into certain areas. So you know where they are going. So the pieces are organized before you put anything together. So then you come to the different things that you can make in DDI lifecycle, the different results that you have because of knowing where the little pieces are coming from in the compartments. So DDI CDI, in a way, it's like life cycle. All the pieces are put into their own little compartments. But DDI CDI can handle new data structures and domains. And that's what they are working on right now. And now, well, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the DDI codebook briefly. But I thought it was important to make sure you understand about DDI before trying to explain one of the products. Because if you don't understand what DDI is, you're not really going to understand what the product does. Okay, I've talked enough about the high level material. Now it's time to get down to more granular information. So the DDI codebook is a structure facilitating the production of machine readable codebooks and data dictionaries. And it is built to emulate a physical codebook. So it can catalog a data set. It can describe a single study or a single round or wave in a repeated study. And the latest version of DDI Codebook is version 2.5. But the neat thing about the DDI Alliance is that they are continually taking suggestions from users and improving if improvement is needed. So currently they are working on version 2.6. So the codebook is relatively straightforward. 
there are five sections for it. The first section is the document description. It describes the actual document that you are putting together to describe the survey or the study. The next section is a description of the actual study or survey, and that is what will be put into the data portal. Many of the metadata tags in this section are the same as the ones in the first section. The third section is the data files description, and that is exactly what it says. It describes the actual data file that you are working on. And then you come to the variable description. Any and all information is in there about each and every variable in the study, from the question text, and that would include anything about the question, including any pre-questions. It includes variable label, all the values and the associated labels for that particular variable, the population of each and every variable, and any additional notes. For example, were there instructions for the interviewer? So if you think of some of the surveys, for example, in Canada, we've got the general survey, social survey, which is much like the European social survey. You can have maybe 700 variables in that particular survey, <clears throat> excuse me. So this particular section can be a very, very long section. And then the last section in the DDI codebook is for other study related materials. So that would include questionnaires, any user's guides, any code books, any piece, <clears throat> excuse me, of information that is about the particular survey on which you are working. Now, when I first started doing markup in DDI, I had the DDI Alliance technical document to use. Um, I'm not a techie. <laughs> I don't claim to be a techie. I never have been. So reading this document was really quite difficult for me. I know the information was in there and it was very good information. And for techies, they would have read it and thought, oh, this is just great to use. But it was really hard for me to read it. Now, um, I'm also uh, one of the producers for something called Odyssey, which is the Ontario data portal. And it's where um, all the uh, data centers in Ontario and now across other areas of Canada get their data from. It, it's really an excellent portal. So we started putting together a best practices document. And by the way, when you get the slides, the link for this is in the title on the slide. This is where the link is, is right here, the best practices document. So we first wrote it 10 years ago, but we have updated it a few times. And the last time was last year. And uh, by the way, Odyssey uses the Nestar platform. But the important thing we did in this best practices document was we interpreted the technical description for all of the tags. And then we used lots and lots of examples from different survey producers, because that was important to enable those doing markup to choose the example they needed to suit their purpose. Now, Odyssey has over 500, uh, sorry, 5,000 surveys in it. So that's a lot of marking up that had to happen to put all of these surveys into DDI or into Nestar for people to be able to read. So a lot of students did the work on this. So it was very important to have a best practices document for them to work on. <clears throat> this is what the document looks like. Uh, it's 98 pages and it includes all the DDI tags you might want to use. An explanation of each tag in words you can understand and multiple examples. There are 173 possible tags. You might not use them all and that's fine. And I want to mention also that this document, we have had it translated into French. So I like to give you here an example of what one of the tags looks like in the uh, best practices document. So the number of this particular tag is 1.1.6.3. So it's the one starts off, it tells you that it is from the document description. So you have the technical description right there. That's the little paragraph. And then at the bottom, there's three examples so that you can figure out if one of these examples is what you want to use when you are putting something into the note field. So the number of examples that are included with each tag depend upon the particular tag that we are defining. Okay, and now... Um, before we go on, I have finished my section. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I haven't had a chance to look in the chat box. I warned you I wasn't very good at that. So I'm just going to have a uh, look. Okay, there aren't, aren't any questions at this point in time, and that's great. If you do come up with questions, 
definitely put them into the chat box or into the Q&A and uh, we will make sure to answer them at the end. And now I would like to turn this over to Benjamin. So I will stop Jane, my screen sharing. Jane, um, I yes. saw that Knut raised his hand. So maybe you want to- Oh, talk. okay. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't see a raised hand. I, I will allow him to talk. Hi. Knut. Knut. Okay. Okay. I, so I, maybe he's not there anymore. But um... yeah, I I can't hear you if you're speaking, Knut. Sorry, your microphone's off. I I'm not sure, Amelia, if it can be turned on or. And Uta also uh, has to talk. So. Now, who enables their mics? Is that me or is that you or? Uh, I allow them. Oh, it was an error. To oh. Turn it on. Oh, you were just waving at me, dude. Okay, I'll wave back. Good enough. Uta also raised his hand, but uh, didn't talk. So. Okay, and raise his hand. So let's move to Med okay. to Benjamin talk. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jane, for this brilliant presentation. Yes, my name is Benjamin Boyster. I work for the ESS archive at the NSD in Norway. And there I'm mainly responsible for data management and data documentation of ESS data files. We do, the, we do this documentation mainly with CDI Codebook and CDI Lifecycle. Okay, today we will talk about the CDI Lifecycle in this section. I've chosen three important topics, the very important characteristics of this, um, of this standard. Firstly, I, we start with the identification versioning system then we talk about variable cascade and lineage and finally about the questionnaire design. Let's get started. On this slide you can see the combined life cycle model as it was created about 10 years ago. This model consists of different stages. The purpose is to describe the entire, the entire data life cycle of a study. It starts with a study concept and the data collection, continuing with the data processing and discovery, and ending with the data analysis. And sometimes there's repurposing when you have to update a study. Um, just a yeah. question. Yeah, okay. Sorry, you, you can't see the slides that are not changing. Yeah. But I have to go back and share. Sorry. Not working. Okay. It's better now. Thank you. Are the slides now changing? Yes, it is. It's working. It's fine. Okay. Now you can see the slice cycle model. Is it correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Once again, you can see this life cycle model. And DDI is capable of documenting each stage of the life cycle. We have many elements that can describe each stage in full detail. The DDI life cycle is a rich XML based specification. The characteristics are that you can reuse all made, uh, many metadata components across the data lifecycle. And it also facilitates documentation of changes over time. The current version is DDI lifecycle 3.3. I just want to repeat this slide that was used by Jane earlier. And this shows that we have a couple of schemes in DDI lifecycle. We have a scheme for variables, another scheme for questions, and maybe a third one for classifications. All elements that are part of a scheme have their own life. 
they have an ID and a version, and they can be reused multiple times in order to create to create different items. Let's say we have a question scheme that consists of multiple questions. These questions can be reused in order to create four different questionnaires. Let's talk about the identification versioning system in EDI lifecycle. In EDI, we have so-called typed items that can be elements or objects that are defined by the DDI standard. These items can be managed independently. Examples for these items are questions, classifications, concepts, organizations, or variables. The identification system consists of three parts. It's a combination of the agency identifier, the item identifier, and a version. You can express this in DDI in two formats. And you have a URN, the Uniform Research Name. That is a string of this a string combination of these three elements. Or you 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 um, use these items separately separately in within your items. If your company or agency would like to generate DDI items, then you need to have an agency identifier. If you don't have it, you can obtain it for free from the DDI registry page. This slide is an example of item versioning in DDI lifecycle. Let's say we have a question item with a question text. What's your name? This item has an agency, an ID, and a version. Then at a later point in, point in time, you would like to reuse this question. Before you do that, you would like to correct the typo to what is your name? Then you can save it as a new version, but you still use the same ID and the same agency. Benefits of the system are that you can manage items separately from each other. You can reuse a specific version of an item. You can also track provenance between items and track changes to items over time. Some more words about reuse of items. It's really important to understand that the same item can be referenced from multiple locations. If you define one item just one time, and then you can use them in multiple relationships. The example is you have a question that is used in multiple questionnaires and can reference to a specific version of an item. You can choose the latest version or an earlier version. That's another example of, of reusing items. On this slide, you can see, see three different questions, Q1, Q2, and Q3. These are independent items, but they are pointing to the same response domain. In this case, it's a managed scale representation with two anchor points strongly agree and strongly disagree. All questions are pointing to the same version of this element. Another important thing to notice is that you might version up the metadata tree when you change a certain element in the DDI lifecycle. XML is a nested data structure. You have top level elements and nested elements. On this slide, you can see a category, Liberal Democrat. This is an item with an ID and a version, and it's used by a code list. A code list is, a, is an element that is higher up in the hierarchy. It consists of six values, and they have references to categories. Then, in the second wave of the study, you would like to update this code list. To do this, you have to drill into a category, for example, to liberal Democrats. Then you change the label to liberal Democrats and save this item as version two. In order to apply the changes for the code list, you also have to change the, um, the reference to liberal democrats, and now you have to point to version two of this element. A, a code list again is, a, a, is an element that is used by a variable or by a question, and all elements that are using the code list have to be updated. So you create a new version of the variable. And then a variable can be a part of a data file or a variable group. 
Also, these elements have to be updated if you want to apply the change. The quest, uh, data file again is a part of the study, and the study can be a sub element of a top level element to the study group. So, you have to update the entire element chain in the XML tree. On this slide, we can see provenance. This is a different concept in DDI. Provenance means that two items can be related. For example, this code list on the left side is the long form for measuring education. It's a long code list. To facilitate the analysis, the data manager has created a second code list. This is a short form of the first code list, and it's a derived one. To express the relationship, you can set a base and reference in order to describe this relationship. This is also a very powerful feature in DDI lifecycle. Now we come to the second part of this presentation, the variable cascade and lineage. These are very nice concepts in DDI lifecycle and very powerful when it comes to data harmonization and data compare. Let's start with a CSV file. This is a flat file with information is stored in columns. In the first row, we can see the variable names and in the rows are the data. In my example, we have four different variables. Each variable is of a different type. The first one is a text domain. Then we have a numeric domain, a daytime domain and a code domain. This, this variable marital status consists of two different codes, S and M. In DDI, we can use a code list in order to give a meaning to the codes. We create a code list that consists of codes that have references to categories, single and married. Now let's say that we have a repeated study or a longitudinal study, where we have measured the same variables or questions three times. In the first two ways, we see still the codes S and M. Then in 2018, there comes up a new code, code D. D stands for divorced. This information can be expressed in DDI lifecycle in this way. For the first two variables, we use one code list with the codes single and married. Then for the third variable in 2018, we attach another code list with the three codes, S, M, and D. You can do it in two different ways. Either you point to different code lists or you point to different versions of the same code list. That's up to the user. For data manager, you would like to compare these codes. For this task, DDI offers a special um, structure. It's also called variable cascade. It consists of three levels, the variable, the representative variable, and the conceptual variable. The variable is just a column in a data set. A, rep a representative variable describes how a variable is measured. In this case, we need two different representative variables. And at the top, we have the conceptual variable that binds mm -hmm. the variables together. This is the most gener generic way to describe a variable. Later on, we can see a short example from our database. Let's get to the next. What are the benefits of the structure? The benefits are that it, allow, that it allows comparison of variables across data sets, and it also facilitates variable emanation. Let's get to variable lineage. This describes the origin of a variable. It can express the relationship between a concept, a question, and a variable. And it can, for example, document a derived variable and see how it has been computed. This slide is one example. At the top, we have a variable, highest level of education. It's using the short form of highest level of education. This is derived from another variable, edu level B, that is using a long code list. This variable, again, can be the result of a question. What is the highest level of education? This question, again, can have a reference 
to a concept that in this example is education attainment. And education attainment, again, is a subconcept of the concept education. The entire chain can be expressed in DDI lifecycle by using the reference structure. Now we come to the last part of the presentation, to the questionnaire design. A questionnaire can be divided in DDI in different items. We have some very reusable parts, like the question item, and some less reusable parts, like the control construct and the question constructs. This example is a show chart from the European Social Survey. Here we have the question text. On an average weekday, how much time do you spend watching television? And we have the code list, missing values, categories, and code values. This is the reusable part of a question and can be used in different questionnaires. Then we have, we have some information that is more mode specific. For example, the question name, the question number, the interview instructions, and the questionnaire flow. It's very specific to a questionnaire, and it's less reusable. To structure this information, we have different control constructs in the DDI lifecycle. We have, for example, the question construct, construct that points to a question. We have a sequence. This is, a, this is an order of questions. We have statements. This is information like a comment or a textual description that we can in, include somewhere in the sequence. And of course, we have flow logic, like loops and ifs and else conditions that can be used to order your questions. When we structure the information in your life cycle, we get again, again an XML tree. At the top is a sequence. Then we re refer to some question constructs and interview instructions, show cards. We can also implement the ifs and else conditions and loops. Important to know is that we can use this information for different purposes. We can either create a questionnaire, but the reusable parts can also be used for something else. We can build question banks based on these reusable items. Let's say a user would like to find questions in different languages from different service providers. Then we could create a question bank using the, the, the questions structures in DDI XML. Or we would like to find questions for reuse and attach them with study information or from the data set. There are some question banks that will be presented on this EDI conference. For example, the SESTA EU question banks that contain survey questions of different data sets in different languages from SESTA service providers. Finally, would like to show you the slide about the FAIR principle. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. More about this principle can be found on the GoFAIR website. Important is that DDI helps you to make your data FAIR and is in line with this principle. Okay. At the end, I would like to put everything together and show you one example from our database. To do this, I have to screen another share. I have to share another screen. Okay. This is our question variable database. This is Collectica based. Um, we have a couple of items here. I start with the top level element. This is the study group. This contains information about the series, like the title, the abstract, and the purpose. Down here, we have studies that are attached to the survey. If you click to one of these studies, you can drill in to the study information. You can see again the title, create information, then we have information about the spatial and temporal coverage, and of course, information about the data file. If you drill down to this element, we are far further down within the element tree. 
A data file usually consists of variables. These are expressed or shown here. Another possibility in DDI lifecycle is to order them in variable groups. The variable groups are shown on the left side. I just open the variable group social demographics and click on the item I get. This variable has been shown earlier on a slide. It has a name and a label and a code list. Then we can see this lineage structure that I showed earlier in the presentation. This variable is derived from another variable from highest level of education that has a longer code list in order to measure education attainment. This code list or this variable is measuring a variable, as you can see here in this lineage information. And the question again is measuring a concept, education attainment. The team and a concept again can be a subclass of the main concept education. The last thing I would like to show here today is the variable cascade structure. Let's say we have some conceptual variables, like a political, like a party voted for in last general election. We can say for them, can use Norway as example. When we apply the structure of variable, represented variable and conceptual variable, we can do a code comparison. Here we can compare the codes of a variable over time. In my example, this variable is present in nine rounds of the European Social Survey. We can see that the codes have been harmonized. So the party here has changed its name in round five. And the code is the same over time. I think we stop the presentation here. And I would like to thank you for yeah, for your patience, and now we open the presentation, the tutorial for questions. I'll mention here while you're thinking about your questions that all of these slides are going to be going up um, in the Eddy 2020 uh, Zenodo community. So you'll be able to review them later and get hold of I, either one of us to uh, ask us questions, which I'll put my video on, sorry. Yeah, so you can still get a hold of either one of us afterwards to ask us questions if you have any. And be sure, be sure to check the schedule for the other sessions that are upcoming because there really are some uh, very good ones in there. And there's a bit of a break now until the one uh, later on today. So you'll be able to get some of your work done and then come back to Eddie and listen to the session. I can see one question in the chat. The question is from Alina. She asked, do you recommend DDI lifecycle for single studies? Um, I would say it depends on your resources. So if you have tools in order to structure your data and life cycle, and you have a lot of information to structure, then it can be worth using DDI life cycle. But I think it's easier for a single study to use DDI codebook, but it really depends on what you are using and what you are planning. If you want in the future, if you would like to reuse elements you want to repeat your study, then it can be worthwhile to structure it in the DDI life cycle. It depends.
that's when it can help to talk to your colleagues also to find out what they've done and whether they found the one is better to use than the other one. And sometimes putting that type of question out on the uh, the DDI listserv, you can get back some really good answers from people and that just helps you to uh, figure out yourself which one would be better to use. Yes, my, uh, thank you, Alina. Yes, my best practice guide is absolutely um, available for anyone online. It's okay. Um, it is in the slides and the link is in the title on the slides. So anyone can use it who wants to. That's why we put it together for everybody to make DDI Codebook a whole lot easier to use. There is a question in the Q&A model from Noemi. She asked, uh, uh, okay. DDI allows to use high level elements like group and subgroups. How do you use them? Do you have a short example? Um, yes, I could show you a, an example of groups and subgroups. Um, but for what elements do you, you do you mean? Groups for questions or for variables? Yeah, I can just show you yeah, one, one short example again. From our database. So variables, yeah, I just opened a data file. And the variables are ordered here in, in these groups, like here, politics. All variables that belong to, uh, to this group politics can be shown here, or media and social trust. This is a very short group. Another group example is on the serious level. Um, a series can contain Subseries or studies. Also, these can be structured in, in groups. But I think the questions can also be be question can also be stored into groups. So you, and then you can use them and or order them for reuse for reuse, for example. Does it answer your question? Jane, can you answer the question from Wiebeke in the question and answer section? Yeah, I imagine you can. I mean, I've only ever worked with uh, the Nestar and the, the reader is free and uh, you, you can see it all very clearly, all the information's there. Um, I know that there's a number of presentations afterwards uh, by the Collectica folks and also some talking about Dataverse. So if you're able to attend those sessions, that should show you um, a bit better how they use it and what you can do. Yeah, I think that's correct. You have to talk with the people who are responsible for the tools.
Yeah, now it's almost 11. There are no more questions in the chat. Should we close yeah. the tutorial for today? Yeah, because our contact information is on the slides. Uh, you'll see it there to be able to get a hold of us. So thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference. There are great presentations coming up. Yes, thank you very much and enjoy. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.